بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم اینڈ اے ویری گڈ آفٹرنون آئی نو اٹ از اے ویری ڈیفیکل ٹائم آئی ایم ناٹ ریفرنگ ٹو دی گلوبل ٹائم اور دا ملیشین ٹائم دا پولیٹیکل وٹ وی کال ہائی لائٹس بٹ اٹ از آفٹر ویری ہیوی لنچ They usually, in training and that kind of a sessions, they say this is the graveyard session because <laughs> everybody goes into a semi-sleeping mode or something like that. And I'll put that aside. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome, I, I don't know whether I should say His Excellency, Young Burhormat, or whatever it is, a very honorable gentleman, an educationist, turned conveniently into politics. I would say conveniently for the benefit of the Ummah and the Malaysian people. And uh, he became the Minister of Education. And as the saying goes, sometimes ministers come make changes to policies and before they get implemented they are no longer ministers but he is one of them who came in and with i would say good commitment and from the education people who are around here they have said that this was a man who could listen to us he understood what the problems were able to see the future and definitely he wanted to make changes and some of the changes have been beneficial to most of you who are present here. Now, Tansri Michael is sitting right in front of me and he has asked me to say a few words of welcome, uh, not to introduce the former minister, and currently he is holding a couple of portfolios back to the academic side whether it is a roving professor or a visiting professor i will not uh, say much about it but he is also asked by the prime minister to be the chairman of the international uh, advanced islamic center the IAIS, Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies. Uh, with that, I would like to ask you to give him a round of applause to welcome him. Your Excellency, this morning we had a good opening with the Sarawak government education minister and his team giving us a perspective of what Sarawak is doing within the education system, which is a federal responsibility. But within that system, based on their historical trends, before even 1963, they have established framework and institutions which are propelling the state government to achieve some of the national visions, Malaysian, as well as its own vision of 2030. So I will not repeat what has been very adequately said by the Minister Roland uh, early in the morning. But in the first panel session which I chaired, Your Excellency, is that the education system is in a way fragmented with so many variations and varieties, particularly in the early childhood. We have got four streams that goes to different ministries and different emphasis, no coordination in the curriculum. And of course, the Ministry of Education, which you were presiding over at some time earlier, has got its own curriculum development and the curriculum development 
to what extent it is able to be adaptive to the changes that are coming both in Malaysia and also in the global front. Whether we are industry ready, and sometimes we ask the questions, are we preparing our children and our students and our graduates for industry, or are we looking at them more than the preparation? Because we are talking about they being members of a family, they are being members of another family that they will create. They are members of the community. They are members of the Malaysian national identity and also in the global. So these are challenges that have come into and education is a preparedness for not only for livelihood, but for life long. And because you are coming from the Institute for Advanced Internet Islamic studies, I just want to say, I always fear that there is another danger that is creeping in, that is the religious education, which seems to be completely away from the national system, not complementing and supplementing each other. Particularly, I'm now thinking about the sort of, I'm not against religious education, I want Every child, whether it is a Muslim or a Hindu or a Christian or a Jew or a Buddhist, whatever it is, we want the religious education to be part and parcel of a value system that is wholesome to make the person an individual. So education for body, education for the mind, education for the soul, and of course, education for the hereafter. But don't particularize only education for the hereafter. Leave the body, leave the mind, leave the soul, then you are a living corpse. Uh, I would just like to say we have to be very careful and then the expectations from your point of view in the national education system is very great and I hope the former minister, and now hopefully will be able to take up a position in the government in the future to come. With that prayer, I would like to welcome His Excellency Dr. Mazli Malik to address you and give us some guidance in this education, National Education Summit. Thank you very much. Rahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you, Datuk Sri. Tan Sri, Datuk Prof, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I feel very grateful to be invited again to this event, this annual event that we had. I mean, the last time I came, it was uh, before COVID, was it? Or somewhere before COVID? Yeah. Um, before I start my going to be very brief talk, I would like to quote uh, a word by one of Indone famous and well-known Indonesian scholar and philosopher, uh, Abdul Malik Karim Amrullah, or better known as Hamka. Uh, he has quoted saying that, he was quoted saying that life is akin to the ocean. Those who are careless when paddling the boat, holding the rudder and guarding the sail will result in all being consumed by the rolling waves, lost in the middle of a vast sea. Nothing will reach the edge of the land. So the topic of our event today is future ready education for a future capable society. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Honestly, the life that we are facing now, the period of time that we're living now, akin to the post 2 p.m. moment that we're enjoying now, is very tough, very difficult. 
and we don't want to be callous in paddling the boat like Amka mentioned earlier. Because if we are callous, we'll be, we'll be taken away by the waves that will never bring us to the shore. Today I want to talk about three major things. Number one, how the world has changed. And number two, the state of our education at the moment. And number three, about where are we heading to. The very first topic about the world that we're living now, it has changed a lot since a couple of years ago. And we're talking about the future. Our future will be shaped by our, by our present. Whether we like it or not, our present is totally different from what we experienced in the past. The failure to understand the changes that are happening now and that will shape our future in these coming days, months, years, decades, will make us clueless and we'll never reach the shore, just like Hamka mentioned earlier. we carelessly paddling the boat, we did not really handle our sail well, we will never reach the shore. So this is where we need to admit that the time that we're living now is different from the years that we used to experience in the past. The failure to understand the changes will reflect in our failure in shaping our education and at present. And the failure to shape our education at present to prepare our country, our next generation, our children for their future will guarantee the failure of the nation in the future. So this is where, if we look at the pandemic, COVID-19, how it changed the lifestyle of human being, how it changed the way we look at education, not only the basic education, but also the tertiary education, the way people work, the way people perceive life and people perceive happiness and people define well-being. As you remember today in the early morning, my wife, who is a lecturer at OUM and Prof. Zani, the president of OUM, is here. She sent me a questionnaire for her research. No, it's very unfair to send an email of a questionnaire to her own husband. But there, she addressed me very professionally, not asking me, my beloved husband, abang, sayang, whatever. She addressed me, dear Prof, we have, <laughs> we have a list of questions we would like to, to answer. It's about digital technology in higher education. So she was, I mean, not only her, I mean her team was asking, asking me about how would the digital technology make a difference for a postgraduate student's life? What if she, I mean, any postgraduate students who still believe in the conventional way of learning and try to ignore the latest, the latest technology, the online classes, the LMS, these and that, you know, trying to live his or her way with the old school type of learning? And what if the professors insisted on that? I know that there are few that are really resist towards all this new technology. But trust me, they'll be left behind. So this is where I answered with a, with a, some, uh, with, with a simple sentence by saying that if they fail to make themselves educate with the latest technology in education, they will fail to shape their future. The same goes with education. As you remember a couple of days ago, we are still talking about the policies of the 90s in education. And that was not the only thing. Every day in the media, people keep talking about certain policies, certain approaches, and, cert and certain, let we say, uh, uh, policies 
that had been enacted in the 90s that still being implemented and being practiced now not only by the government but also by the learning institution without looking at the changes that happen in the country, in the economy and also in the public life. COVID has changed things, has changed the way we look into education tremendously. Not only COVID, we have gig economy. You want to prepare our next generation to be educated, to become part of the gig economy actors, you need to change the way we teach them at school. A couple of weeks ago at IAIS, a very unknown institution that had been given to me for my pro bono service to lead, uh, we organized a special closed door roundtable discussion about the SPM drop, dropout. And what were the causes that led towards kegagalan SPM and what should we do? It's very unfortunate when we look at our politicians from the government side or from the opposition side. When they were addressing the issue, they were addressing about the numbers rather than talking about the solutions and talking about the causes. You still remember when the Prime Minister quoted certain figures and then the opposition who were represented by the former Minister of Education did not address about the issue, but he was rather attacking the Prime Ministers by misquoting the numbers or the figures. And then the government came into the picture, I mean the MOE, to defend the Prime Minister figures. So the key issue, the main issue was not even addressed. <laughs> the solution for it was never being uh, discuss, we became lost. I'm, 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 I'm very disappointed with the way we're looking at education at the moment. Politicians fail us miserably. Am I right? And it's very fortunate. And it's very fortunate the one that's standing before you is a politician too. <laughs> but I hope I won't <laughs> fail you guys in this tough time <laughs> artificial intelligence big data ir 4.0 all of these changes has urged us to change the way we teach our children the way we understand about education the way we seek knowledge the way we implement knowledge and the way the teachers teaching their students and the way the parents responding to their kids. It's very unfortunate that nowadays when talking about education, we still are complaining about things that have been discussed a couple of decades ago. The infrastructure issue, I think definitely the Sarawak government did mention about the dilapidated schools, the condition of uh, poor infrastructures in schools in Sarawak, in Sabah and some parts of Semenanjung. We're still talking about the lack of quality amongst our teachers. The poor quality of English amongst our teachers. What more? Mathematics and science, STEM. And we're still talking about how our teachers are ill-equipped with the best skills in education. And we did not pay much attention to it. It was never been addressed. It's always the political issue, the quota issue, vernacular schools, talking about uh, peruntukan for uh, sekolah SJKC, SJKT. I mean, we trap in a very non-productive discussions when we talk about education. And when education is trying to push the main issue, normally it will be sidelined by the media. I put the blame equally to the media. They like to sensationalize a lot of issues that is not the core or the main issues in education. You know, you talk about uh, teachers' training. I bet any of our media will pick that up. The moment you talk about the uh, vernacular school, well, all the media will come in. You talk about the quota 
uh, for Malays to higher education, all the media will jump into you to get your opinions on what and whatnot. But when you started talking about the reading culture, you're talking about how our high learning institution is disconnected from the industry, how we fail our graduates by giving them a lot of subjects that they don't need in their uh, work life, how we fail to equip our school children with certain skills, certain significant skills that can help them to survive in the gig economy, regardless whether they, 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 they pass their SVM or they fail in their SVM. We never talk about that. And if you talk about it, trust me, no media will pick that up. So again, I still remember I met with uh, Minister Fami Fadil from the KKD, Kementerian uh, Communikasi Digital. I told him, education is not only the responsibility of our friend Fadlina. It's not only the responsibility of Khalid Nodin. It's also your responsibility. As, as a person who is in charge of media, you must make sure that media will be the best means to educate the, uh, the people. Not only the children, but also the parents. Not only the educationists, the educators, but also, I mean, the big masses. We need to educate. Uh, we need to educate our people by using the media. All these changes, all these disruptors, COVID, AI, big data, chat GPT, IR 4.0. will shape our future. And our education system at the moment must be re-engineered accordingly to make sure that our children and our future generation are ready for all those changes in the future according to the, disrupt, uh, to the dis uh, disruptions made by the disruptors. The second topic I would like to talk about is the state of our current education system. When we talk about our education system, normally people will only talk about schools and tertiary education. Starting from preschool and how everybody is working in silo. You know, I still remember in our discussion back then in 2018 with other ministries, we said that preschooling need to put under MOE and not a bit under KPWKM, a bit under JAKIM, another bit under Kementerian Papaduan, and no, everything must go under MOE. So we tend to agree on that. We were preparing a cabinet paper on that, but unfortunately, the notorious Sheraton move happened. And a month before that, the Minister of Education then was asked by the Prime Minister to give the position to the Prime Minister. So the dream became dream. <laughs> we did not manage to implement that. The schooling system, primary, secondary, the tertiary, uh, tertiary education. Did we really prepare our students with enough significant skills that they need in facing these new challenges? I doubt. I still remember when in 2019, I set up a committee called Big Data Committee in the Ministry of Education with the aim to collect all the data from the students from preschooling until they finish their high school. And we need to connect that data with industry. And we need to analyze the data based on AI and deep analytics to find the best potential from each student so it can avoid the issues of mismatch. It can save the time of the students. They don't need to spend four donkey years studying things that they don't even use in their uh, real life. They don't even need to spend, I mean, just now you mentioned about International Islamic University where I used to teach for 18 years or maybe 20 years then. Um, I mean, the least 
of years that need to be spent by students in international Islamic universities is five years. I mean, one of my staff, he graduated from IUM. I think you spent six years, I mean. I mean, you spent six years in the university? Four years, okay. Uh, you're the luckiest one then. But not everybody as, as lucky as you. Some of them, they need to spend six years, especially those who are taking law. The lease is four years, like I mean. But most of them, they need to spend five years, the average. I was telling my second daughter, who is now at the International Islamic University, you need to spend five years taking finance. And your sister, she's studying at MSU, will only spend three and a half years. Once you graduated, both of you graduated, you're going to receive the same salary, the same amount of salary. So why should you spend five years doing something that I don't think very productive in your future life? So a lot of things need to be re-engineered, need to be restructured in our education system. Special needs education. How is it now? I can rarely heard from the media or from the ministries talking about special needs education. Unlike what we had five years ago, almost every day we could hear news about special needs education, about TVET, about STEM, but nowadays, I don't think people have that enthusiasm to talk about education anymore. Talking about TVET education, and also talking about the reading culture. Nobody talks about reading culture anymore. Nowadays, although it relates closely with education, it should be addressed. As you remember, in 2018, we launched the Dekat Mbacha National in which we were aiming then to reach the status of reading nation by the year 2030. And we launched the Malaysia Mambacha campaign to turn reading as part of the way of life of Malaysia. But now, I, 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 I'm not sure whether we still have that. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure. But I haven't heard of it in the media anymore. The book industry is very unfortunate to look at the status of the book industry in Malaysia. Book industry is put under MBKM, Majlis Buku Malaysia, which was put under one division of the Minister of Education, which is BSTP. A small, tiny part of it. So how in the world you want to create a reading nation when you put the book industry down under a very isolated department. Unlike what we had in Indonesia, Jokowi, during his first, his first term, he put Backcraft, you know, the, the creative industry in which book industry is part of it, he put it directly under the president. He himself supervised it to make sure that Indonesia will become a reading nation. And Indonesia put a, 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 a huge emphasis on the book industry. We're not doing that seriously. It's very unfortunate, although reading is the very crucial part of education. And also the civic awareness. I, I'm not sure whether some of you still remember in, in the late 80s and early 90s when Singapore uh, was promoting their sm small kodomo, uh, small lion. They wanted to teach their children on civic education. There when Lee Kuan Yew banned chewing gum, among other things. But still remember, it appeared on SBC. Then it was only SBC. SBC 5, SBC 8, talking about civic awareness, not to, uh, to, to keep the tidiness of the country, not to throw rubbish uh, as you like, to preserve the cleanliness or the tidiness of your flat areas, you know, how to behave to the elders, how to give seat to the elders. You could see a lot of advertisement then in Singapore television channels. SBC 5, SBC 8, on their radio channels are talking about it. Uh, we're not having that yet in Malaysia. I could see a lot of civic awareness uh, advertisements 
in Thailand, but not in Malaysia. Uh, we rather spend it on something else, maybe. And that is the state of our current education. And we need to change that. We need to change that. So it comes to the third point. Where are we heading to? I've, I have a six million dollar question to our friends from Ministry of Education. How is our national education blueprint doing? You know that we have the very first education blueprint in our national history, uh, Plan Pembangunan Pendidikan Kebangsaan, which will end in 2025, but we haven't heard anything from it at the moment. It reaching its end, tak lama lagi, is only a year away, because by the year 2025, it's over, so we only have 2024. But we haven't heard any discussion about it in public, we haven't heard any debate about it, and we haven't heard any evaluation about it, not from the ministry alone, but from the industry, from the civil society, from the educators, from the educationists, from the parents. And we want to know whether they have managed to achieve their goals. I'm not sure. And it's very unfortunate that we're not talking about it anymore. So remember, in 2019, we form, or 2018, we form a committee called Jawatan Kuasa Kajian Dasa Pendidikan. Committee to study this, the education system of Malaysia, which consists of experts from all walks of life, apart from politicians. Politicians were not allowed to enter the committee. So we had then uh, Professor Ibrahim Bajunin, who was initially leading that committee. Then we have Professor Madeline Burma, that famous economist from UKM. We had uh, Cikgu Sheryl Fernando. We had, who else with us? That, Dati Nazima? No, no, you, you, you're in the Majid Penasihat. Dati Satina in Majid Penasihat. Who were we with us then? Uh, I mean, people, uh, uh, Professor Zaharuddin and few others, experts in, in STEM, experts in technology, experts in education, experts in all sorts of uh, industry, they came together, came out with their evaluation on the education system, and they came out with their proposal. And their proposal was the new education model, NEM. That new education model was crafted to be a groundbreaking and a game changer for the country, for the nation. To end the three decades education system that had been uh, created in the 90s based on the socio-economic of the 90s and based on the political situation in the, in the 90s and based on the global trend then. So this new education model in, in which we put emphasis on the compulsory K-12, for example, on the single entry to universities, you know, it's rather funny to look at Malaysia. You look at other countries, for example, in the UK, they have A-level as an entry to the university. You go to, to the US, they have, they have SAT. Australia, we have something else, Azra, what, what do you call it? The entrance to the university. And you have IB. But you come to Malaysia to go to university, you have multiple entries. Definitely, it's not going to be SPM. SPM is meaningless. SVM is another entrance to another entrance to the university. It's either you take STPM, which is very unpopular among the Malays, or you go to Metriculasi, the most popular destination for the Malays, or you go to uh, Asasi, or you have diploma, or you have uh, Pesediaan, you have these, you have that, and, you know, lately, uh, we were very happy looking at our metriculacy has been recognized by Cambridge. Although Cambridge has already recognized STPM since decades. So we were talking about this, a single entry. Single entry examination to the university. We can get away with a lot of old models. With the latest one. Ah, and then 
I know. Some people will say, then what about the quota of this race or the quota of that race? I still remember people asking me about that then. But I was a minister who's under the control of the prime minister. I didn't live without script to be read. But again, since I'm a normal person, just like any other person in this hall, I can say it now. Am I allowed to do that? Yes. yes, okay. It is not about which race will go to the university. It's about the graduate employability that we concern more. You know, the graduate unemployability for the year 2020 is more than 25%. So are we saying that we want a lot of certain race to come to the university to become unemployed graduates? That will defeat the purpose of getting them inside the university. In the 90s, it's true. When you find the dominant race were not in the university. As a result, they couldn't find good jobs because whoever went to the university in the 90s will be secured to get a better job. But that is not the case of the world that we're living now. Now even, you know, you're talking about uberization of higher education. Now, a lot of people, they don't need to go to university. They can just register online courses that have been recognized sometimes by Harvard University, by Oxford or whatever. They accumulate all the online courses they need to spend some money, and with that, they can get much better job than those who are going to metric or to Pusat Asasi, to this IPTA, to that IPTA. Or alternatively, maybe they, they choose not to go to university because they can make tons of money through TikTok or YouTube or whatever. They can just register online at OUM. The time they spend, the time their friends spend in IPTA, in public universities, they can spend it for various activities. They can spend a few hours a day on their TikTok, another hours for the YouTube, and some hours for OUM online classes. And after four years, they can graduate. And it's not easy to graduate from OUM, trust me. It's unlike what people are having in their mind. It's not easy. Provisani, yeah? Am I right? But because they have a very high standard and, and very uh, complete and uh, sophisticated ecosystem for online learning that will allow that influencers or that TikTokers not only to accumulate their wealth but also to graduate. So all these changes must be taken into consideration by the policy makers. When? I'm not sure what, the, what is the latest development in our higher education. Do we have any latest development? Oh, who's the minister now? Oh, sorry, my friend. Datuk Sri Khalid Nodin. Sorry, sir. I forgot about you. Okay. Because we... we re <laughs> yeah, too many ministers who didn't say anything, so never knew that they even exist. So... Yes, with all these changes, we need to change the way we look at education. So, this is where, for the SPM dropouts, Gagal SPM, do they still have second chance? Yes, they do. A lot of tertiary education uh, institutions, uh, vocational institutions, or maybe even OUM, you can create something which is away from MQA. Trust me, MQA is making most people's life miserable. They're not helping us. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, MQA was under me, lah, I know. But looking at these changes in our life now, MQA need to upgrade themselves. Or maybe they do whatever they do, but you guys, I mean, from the private institution, need to have different approaches. Rather than solely depending on MQA, you can go to Human Resource Ministry. Or maybe you go to the industry. 
you cut the cross. You don't need to go to MQA. You don't need to go to KSM. Go directly to the industries who can recognize your program. I mean, definitely, if you can approach Bajaya, for example, you can approach uh, Asia, my friend Tony, and few others, get their recognition on your programs. You don't need to go to MQA or whatever. Make sure that your graduates can be employed by those companies. That will be more valuable than spending how many years in the universities ended up not being employed. Oh, it's over. Okay, never mind. I, I tried to cut it short. Early TVET education. The new education model that you, you can read throughout the slides. I have no time because the, the slides going haywire, topsy-turvy. I mean, the early TVET education. We wanted to introduce TVET in this new education model. We wanted to introduce TVET as early as 13 years old. So for whoever choose not to go along the academic path, they can go straight away at the age of 13 to TVET. And not only that, the apprenticeship system. For every student, when they reach the age of 15, they can go straight away, you know, not go straight away. They must, have, they must spend certain hours in a year in a workplace to get some experience and that will be part of their school living certificate to get them familiarized with the working ethics, working place, the reality, etc. The modular based curriculum, uh, big data, AI and deep analytics as part of education, holistic whole society approach to education. We don't want education to be the sole responsibility of MOE. Oh, sorry, I need to rephrase that. We don't want MOE to be the sole guardian of education. We want everybody to come into the picture. The industry, private sectors, we want the civil society, we want the parents, we want the uh, local governance to be part of uh, education and etc. And it should be a need-based and student-centric education. It's not only based on what teachers think the best, but what the student needs in their life, especially in the future. I know, I'm, I'm going to finish now. So, I talk a lot about all these things in my book, CPR for Malaysian Education. CPR for Malaysian Education, but um, it's very for unfortunate. This book is sold out, but you can place an order on kedaimazli.com. But the Malay version of it is being sold out there, Generasi Yang Hilang, the Bahasa version of it. You can get a copy of it. As for the higher education, I've written Reformacy University, but again in Bahasa, on how we can reform uh, the, the university, private university, and also the public university. I mean, during my time, I don't see any demarcation between private and public university. They are all the same. You're talking about universities. Universities are universities. We should, we should not say that, okay, uh, this public university is under MOHE. The private universities, they're only our customers. No. You're talking about teacher education? They are one. Whether they are universities, private, public, you're talking about polytechnics, you're talking about vocational, it should be part of the integral tertiary education. And something about MOE in 20 months. Memory is not memoir. Normally, politicians like to write autobiography or memoirs. I hate to write memoirs because, you know, I just couldn't imagine somebody talk about himself and then telling it to people. People don't want to know about yourself. People want to know what you have done, what has not been reported by the media. The media might be interested only with black shoes and jawi, but we tell them it is beyond black shoes and jawis. There are a lot of other things that have been hidden by the media or, or been hidden by the netizens. Um, 20 months experience of education reform, and this is the very first book written on education by a Minister of Education in Malaysia for the very first time in Malaysian history. If you don't grab a copy of it, uh, 
you lose a big fortune in the future. <laughs> yeah? Come again? <laughs> no, I mean, you can get it from outside. I mean, it's only the 50% of uh, what we have done together. It's not the effort by the minister then. It's, it's very useless, the minister. But what his team and what the nation along with him has contributed to the education system or at least tried to do to, for the education. But unfortunately, it only lasted for 20 months and it's been recorded in this book. So grab a copy of it. Maybe if there's still a chance in the future, we can revive again what we have started. We're going to finish what we have started together. We're going to work together again. Thank you very much.